Okay, welcome everybody who's watching. We got 14 people now and it will fill up as we go. Uh, I really want to welcome Dr. Dennis R. McDonald. Uh, and I noticed your middle name is, um, <laughs> has probably caused you some grief uh, in the past. Ronald, Ronald McDonald. You get yeah, I'm the other clown. <laughs> And um, my middle name's actually McDonald as well, so. No kidding. Well, you know, for a profession, I um, I value, I place price tags on uh, a lot of McDonald's franchises. So we all have the McDonald uh, relationship here. Uh, but um, I want to start this live stream by maybe going into a little bit of your uh, past, Dennis. Um, are you a Christian? Were you ever a Christian? What kind of religious background did you come from? Well, I came from a very conservative um, Baptist background. I'm a graduate of Bob Jones University, um, which gives me some street cred, I would think, with the evangelical world. But I became increasingly dissatisfied with um, a fundamentalist way of reading the Bible and helped start the Sojourner magazine during the civil rights movement, anti-war movement, and so on. And during that time also became more interested in a critical assessment of the New Testament. Uh, translated the New Testament for myself when I was 21. Oh, wow. And became, became fascinated with the moral vision of the early Christians and how diff different that was from the fundamentalism that I knew. So I consider myself a Christian, but I uh, confess to have serious doubts about the existence of God. But that doesn't make me a mythicist. And for those who are listening, mythicism is a form of atheism that denies that Jesus ever existed. My work has been attractive to some of them because I do talk about mythologizing trends in the early church. But those trends need to be placed in the context of an actual historical person about which there ought to not be very serious doubt. But also that mythologizing doesn't necessarily mean that it's ahistorical or that it's not serious or that it's a, a plagiaristic or simply uh, fictionally plastic. It has to do with how early Christians valued Jesus as a superhero of justice and compassion by framing these stories in the context of classical Greek mythology. They're trying to talk about how Jesus is competitive with the likes of Heracles or Odysseus or um, Achilles and even the Greek deities, but superior in terms of compassion and justice um, and by the way, this kind of thing was done by Jews even before, uh, at least 100 years before the writing of the Gospels. So we're talking about something that was well understood in antiquity. And in fact, often imitation was transgressive or aggressive against the model. So um, as uh, Julian the Apostate complained that Christians in their teaching of Homer we're creating arrows that are feathered with the wings of pagans. And I think that's a pretty good metaphor for what I am arguing, that these borrowings are equipping early Christian and Jewish communities to establish their identity over against the very powerful mythologies of Greeks and Romans. When you got your PhD, did your mentor have similar thoughts or did you just come up with this idea on your own to investigate it further? Um, no, I didn't even have those thoughts at the time. Uh, I was very heavily influenced by a famous classicist named Albert Lord, who wrote a book on the, uh, the Singer of Tales. And he introduced me to Homer and some of his students who had been working on Homeric imitation uh, became my friends when I was in graduate school. My minor at Harvard was in the Latin reception of Greek philosophy. So I was familiar with Greek and Latin literature, but it was only after graduating, yeah, several years after graduating, that I first recognized that one finds extensive parallels in early Christian literature 
between um, classical Greek poetry, Homer above all, but also the tragedians and Homeric hymns. And I've uh, kind of made a career of that ever since. It sounds like... Uh, so... Yeah, go ahead, Cam. The, um, was it the Acts of Andrew? Yes. You first found parallels. So ha have you found um, examples of imitation in uh, other non-canonical Christian writings? Um, not until you get to the Byzantine period, but the Byzantines were intellectuals, Christian intellectuals who wished to uh, beautify uh, gospel narratives and um, often used Homeric lines in order to retell gospel stories. These are the so-called Homeric gentones. But we also have um, a recension of the Gospel of Nicodemus that was written sometime probably between the 9th and 12th centuries that retells the story of Jesus' death and resurrection but clearly is imitating the death of uh, Hector in his burial in doing so. Um, I would add, though, that Jews are doing this in their Apocrypha. I finished uh, an article recently on Judith some time ago. I did one on Tobit. Uh, other scholars have made similar arguments uh, related to Third Maccabees and the Bacchae, and uh, several scholars have noted Homeric imitation and to, and to some extent, tragedians in Josephus's rewriting of biblical uh, texts. So this enterprise was widely recognized in schools and it was not plagiaristic. It was considered a form of creativity. So that mimesis involved imitatio, not, but also inventio, that it was, um, there was a creativity in imitation. An example that I would give is uh, O Brother, Where Art Thou?, which is a parody of the Odyssey, but it's announced, um, it's not disguised, it's not plagiaristic, but it's a work of art on its own. One could also make that, that claim for what now is quite dated, the Austin Powers um, uh, movies that was a spoof on James Bond movies. So how do you, uh, what are some of the objections you've heard to your thesis on all of this uh, mimesis? mimesis? Um, what is the most common objection to it, and what do you say? Well, um, there are three major objections, I think. One is that it slights the influence of Jewish scriptures on the composition of the Gospels and Acts. And... I, that is by no means my intention. Of course, there is influence. There are citations, there are allusions, that these are texts that are conscious of the, the biblical heritage. They're also conscious, though, of the classical Greek heritage. And the fact that we have examples among Jews themselves of imitating Homer at least 100 years before the writing of the Gospels, suggest that these authors are standing in a tradition of social formation over against classical Greece. So it is not intended to be anti-Semitic at all. If anything, it's an attempt to say that the Christian heritage of the Jewish religion is competitive and more compassionate than um, Greek mythology and uh, the, the Christian God, the Jewish God is more uh, compassionate and powerful and so on. So that is one objection, that it slights Jewish backgrounds. And I, I really think that's unfair. Another is that the gospel authors were not sufficiently educated in uh, classical Greek composition, and certainly their, their readers were not, so that the kinds of um, allusions or imitations that one finds in the New Testament that I think hark back to Homer, would have been invisible. And they, they often cite the history of interpretation as a way of uh, justifying that. My answer to it is I think we've been quite naive about the ubiquity and the importance of Homer and Greek tragedy in uh, ancient education and readership. I think we also have 
made something of a growth industry of dumbing down the authors of the New Testament into mere transcribers of tradition instead of as narrative artists in their own right. And whether or not the reader understood this, um, these strategies, people who were able to write such powerful narrative would have been exposed to good Greek literature and would have had motivation to, uh, to transform it and to use it, um, whether their readers understood it or not. But I also think we've underestimated the, the educational level of Greek readers of the New Testament. That's not to say that everyone would have picked up these illusions, but certainly some of them could have. If they knew how to read Greek, they'd probably been exposed to Greek uh, tragedy. And it's, so that's one of the objections that's made. So what level of Greek education do you think the author of Luke and Acts received? I think it was really quite high. Um, the we we can see a uh, use of uh, homeric language in uh, the acts of the apostles in particular the clever mimesis of um, greek analogies um, the portrayal of paul as a christian socrates including socratic uh, or platonic um, images and language and so on indicates that he was uh, an elite um, in the Christian movement. And I'm working on an article now with, that argues that there's some evidence that Luke could read Latin. So that what he's accomplishing in the Acts of the Apostles and, and Luke Acts generally is a rival to the Aeneid, whereas the Aeneid imitated Homer to establish the identity of the Roman Empire under Augustus. Um, Luke is trying to do the same thing with the kingdom of God, with the great heroes of Jesus, Peter, and, and Paul, to establish an identity um, for the Christian community. And it's not by accident that both Aeneas and Paul have shipwrecks on the way to Rome to found new communities that merge the identities of one group from the east, either the Trojans or Jews, and Gentiles um, or Italians in the Aeneid, in Rome. And ancient readers, um, I think, should have seen those similarities. There's some reason to think that um, St. Augustine did. And it's it's often said that um, the author of Mark writes in a, um, you know, like a, a low, perhaps uneducated uh, form of Greek. And that um, demonstrates in some way that he didn't have uh, a education and some for example um, some people talk about how Mark uses these connectives and and or then immediately immediately connectives between the narrative which uh, some take to indicate that he is really just transcribing the um, the dictation of Peter or something like this. Uh, do you think that Mark uh, shows a high level or a low level of Greek education? Well, certainly Mark was not the stylist that Luke was. And Luke frequently, in borrowing from Mark, improves his Greek and makes it, uh, removes a lot of those simple connectives. On the other hand, there can be little doubt now that Mark's narrative is brilliant and that he must have had literary models in addition to what any uh, relationship he might have to Hebrew texts or the, the Greek Bible. And so that his, um, it is true that his Greek often is clumsy and domestic, um, even plebeian, one might say, but his uh, narrative skill is remarkable. This is one reason that other analogies of Homeric imitation are so important. One could say the same level of, uh, can see the same level of Greek composition in Third Maccabees or in Judith or in Tobit. You do not have to be highly sophisticated in rhetoric in order to know how to uh, imitate um, you know, classical Greek text and to transpose them. 
by the way, uh, the third uh, objection to my work often is the change of genre and um, sometimes dating and uh, the, the register of Greek. Almost all limitations, not all, but almost all limitations in Greek of Homer from the Hellenistic time through the Roman period are in prose, not in poetry. So if one talks generally about mimesis in the ancient world, one is talking about a transposition, uh, a, a genre shift. And uh, even Quintilian, the, uh, the Roman rhetorician, says that uh, history and uh, epic are related to each other as the same genre insofar as they both are have narrative. And he encourages people who are learning how to write narrative and prose to saturate themselves in Homer. There's a, another rhetorician, Philodemus, who said, who could deny that the writing of prose is informed by poetry? So that kind of genre shift um, is not a problem. And the same thing happens with Register of Greek. Um, Homer and most of the tragedians wrote in archaic Greek. It wasn't even spoken at the time, but certainly it's a, a long distance from there to Koine. So much so that one first century um, grammarian uh, almost an exact uh, contemporary of gospel authors named Apollonius Sophista had to write a lexicon of Homeric terms that were not understood into Koine. And I use that for myself as a kind of second Bible to recognize when you have equivalents, often it's the equivalent that you find in Apollonius Sophista that you find in the New Testament. So it's the way that people would have um, rewritten these texts. The other is the, um, the difference between these epics that are clearly mythological and have um, multiple gods and heroes into Jewish texts where you have one god and you have uh, relatively few heroes. But that's what one finds already in the appropriations of Homer in Judaism. So this, um, the question of moving from a polytheistic text into a monotheistic text is a part of the mimetic strategy to say that whereas you can get by with multiple gods among the Greeks sleeping with each other and mortals and getting involved in warfare and deceiving people through dreams, when you take that and wash it through a kind of Platonic monotheism, that God has to be um, has to represent virtue and truth and um, compassion and what one might call the higher human virtue virtues. And so this the problem of moving from polytheistic text to monotheistic text is well documented in Jewish text well before early Christians. Cam and I uh, have had the privilege of talking with many apologists in the past. <laughs> and uh, we've mentioned you to them. And one objection that they give is, you know how you can look up into the sky and you see clouds, and uh, you know if you just have this certain thought in your head, you can see whatever you want to see when you look up into the clouds. And so their criticism is, well, um, Dr. Dennis McDonald is just forcing these imitations. He's seen something he wants to see. And so I guess my question to you is, how would you respond to that? And how do you, how do you help yourself uh, so this doesn't happen, that you're not fooling yourself when you're seeing these imitations between Homer and, let's say, the Gospel of Mark? Well, there's a certain amount of um, subjectivity in all kinds of literary uh, comparisons. So I'm not denying that some of the comparisons are better than others. But it's all too easy to dismiss the entire methodology by saying that some of the examples are less clear than others. The challenge is, in my view, to explain why one finds over and over and over again um, these similarities. Is it simply accidental? And if, if I might, I'd like to run through the seven criteria of mimesis criticism 
because they're designed to take a lot of the subjectivity out of this analysis. The first is um, accessibility. Did authors and readers in antiquity have access to these texts? And pagan readers or non-Jewish readers would have known Homer better than any other text. And that probably is true of Jews. We have 800 fragments of the Homeric epics in, uh, from Egypt until the year 200 uh, AD or, or, uh, BC, or uh, CE. We have three fragments of the Septuagint, three, and they're fragments. They're not whole texts. So the Homeric epics were used in schools. They were, um, and the second is anal the second criterion is analogy. It's the same thing. Were these texts used in school? Were people imitating them independently? So this is, um, I call it analogy. So when I'm talking about imitations of Homer or Euripides or Plato, we're not talking about obscure texts. We're talking about texts that were better known even among Jews, perhaps, than the Bible. The next three criteria I call the glue that holds two texts together. And this happens even when people are evaluating plagiarism in college or whatever. One is, are the parallels dense or are they random? The second is order. Do the parallels appear in the same sequence? The fifth criterion is the most important probably. It's distinctive traits. Are there things that one finds in the model and the uh, imitation that are distinctive and unusual and that the author could use, in fact, to point to um, the antecedent? A good example of this is in the shipwreck story in the Acts of the Apostles, Luke uses words that never appear in prose in the Hellenistic period in order to flag for his reader that he's imitating an uh, epic. The next is interpretability. Why would somebody want to imitate Homer or Euripides or whatever? And in many cases, it's to portray Jesus or Paul or the Christian God as more compassionate, as a competitor to Greek mythology. The um, final criterion is the knowledge, is um, recognition. Did people in that culture or later readers see the similarities between these stories? And the answer often is yes, even if it's not the dominant position, it still is a part of the reception history of these texts that has been ignored. Now, I'd be the first one to acknowledge that some of the uh, parallels are more compelling than others, and I'm not willing to go to the mat for everything that I see. But it's a little like watching, uh, I used to live in Denver, and I would look at the front range of the mountains. And some of the mountains are clear, but when you look at the peaks in the distance, you can't tell if they're clouds or if they merge into the horizon. Are they really mountains or not? What I find with my critics is they too quickly identify um, the ambiguities of the dis mountains in the distance and deny that you have a whole front range where, the, where the, the connections are so obvious and so potentially meaningful. Now, let me also come back and say, I have some admirers among conservative Christians, that includes evangelicals and some uh, Roman Catholics, who say, I can use mimesis criticism theologically and even in sermons because there's a difference between, and I agree with this, by the way, there's a difference between making a literary comparative judgment and making a historical judgment. One can say that the, these authors inherited traditions or um, uh, uh, historical information which they chose to embellish in order to make it more compelling. And they used models that are available to them in order to do it. I can give you actually some examples. No one denies that there was an apostle Paul. And Paul is, um, we have echoes of, uh, of Paul frequently. At the same time, 
the Paul of the um, Acts of the Apostles, as most interpreters have, have recognized, is a Christian Socrates. So Luke has taken traditions about Paul and embellished them in order to portray Paul more to be like Socrates, so that the two major leaders of the Christian movement, Jesus and Socrates, uh, Jesus and Paul, are depicted um, as uh, as philosophers. So um, I think it's unfortunate. I can understand why people would be leery about my proposal if they want to root these stories in historical fact and any kind of um, the verbal inspiration of the New Testament, or the, especially the Gospels. On the other hand, I, other evangelicals and uh, conservative Catholics are able to use my work by saying this is a matter of embellishment, and the advantage of it is it shows how they value Jesus, how they fill Jesus with special cultural significance over against the dominant culture in which they're living. So I think there's a, a book coming out on my books that uh, will come out soon, as soon as I finish the final essay in evaluating it, and is written largely by evangelicals who are attempting to say, even though MacDonald is more of a skeptic than we are, it doesn't mean that Mimesis criticism is unuseful for modern Christian identity, even among evangelicals. So really... Well, and I, I was just going to say, really, this is a threat to, I guess, the very conservative fundamentalists then uh, who view, you know, when they're reading the book of Mark, that this is history. This is exactly what happened. Um, this imitation theory is very, very damaging to those people. Yes, it would be. Yeah, and I can also imagine how uh, certain... Uh, certain people who want to uh, demonstrate uh, true connections between uh, the New Testament and the Old Testament could also use this method to shore up their hermeneutic. So when a, when a, um, a typology, for example, is recognized um, as uh, being displayed within the Gospels from... Um, the Old Testament, this is a method that could actually be used to shore up that connection between the two texts. Absolutely. Let me give, let me give you a good example. The Q document, and if you don't want to believe in Q, you could just say Matthew in the depiction, or especially Matthew, the depiction of the temptation stories, portrays Jesus as a prophet like Moses and as a symbol of Israel who goes into the wilderness, doesn't eat for 40 days, is tempted by the devil, and the temptations have to do with the kinds of temptations that Israel faced in the wilderness, you know, turning stones into bread and the manna tradition, or Moses viewing all the kingdoms of the world and uh, not, um, and then saying he won't worship um, the devil or the divine protection. And in each case, Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy. Well, this is an example, in my view, of mimesis, of um, Deuteronomy, where Jesus now is portrayed fictively. I mean, do you really think that the, God, the evangelist was there at the Transfigured at Jesus's temptations in the wilderness. No, this is um, this is wonderful fiction, and it's an attempt to show that Jesus, though the Son of God, refuses the prerogatives that are his as the, in that way, and prefers to be the Son of Man, uh, someone who doesn't have a place to lay his head. So, um, Cam, your comment about this being useful for understanding the Hebrew Bible is right on the mark. I can give you ex other examples, and people, other people have too. Jesus performs miracles much like Elijah and Elisha. Now, they uh, probably didn't happen. In my view, they certainly didn't. But the point of it is that Jesus is a prophet who's on par with Elijah and Elisha 
in being able to multiply loaves or to uh, bring healing to people, even as like Elisha and Elijah raising the dead. I want to, uh, for some people watching, we have uh, 38 people watching right now, and some of them, a lot of this might be going over their head. So I want to, forgive me, but I'm going to dumb this down a little bit. <laughs> um, what you're saying is, look, the people who wrote the Gospels, they probably read Greek. In fact, they probably read Homer. And some of the things they wrote, they took out of the Old Testament and um, texts like Homer. And you've come up with some criteria to figure out, okay, is this really true? Or am I just seeing what I want to see? So you came up with seven criteria, uh, things like how accessible were these texts to the, to the authors? How, um, how closely do they match? Is there any distinctive things that we can pull out that it makes it very improbable that you know, they didn't take it from, from other texts? How do we interpret these things? Um, do, is there evidence of other people um, recognizing these uh, similarities? So if that's the criteria, in your opinion, what is the best example that we can go through specifically that really hits these criteria well? And we can say, yes, this is probably an imitation. Uh, the one that I'm most impressed with is the similarities in Mark between the death of Jesus and his burial and the death of Hector and his burial at the end of the Iliad. In both cases, you have a young man who uh, suffers uh, a violent death. In both cases, there are three women who watch from a distance and are involved in mourning for him and in the burial. In both cases, uh, there's a gloating over the, uh, the corpse of the, the dead young man. It, it's Achilles who gloats over having killed Hector, and it's the centurion who says, oh sure, this mortal was a son of a god. That is an ironic statement, that's a gloat. That is not um, a praise. Then the, um, the executioner has kept the body such that an old man needs to go and rescue the corpse. In the tradition, Jesus's father's name is Joseph. But it's not Joseph of Nazareth who buries Jesus, but it's Joseph of Arimathea. And in Greek, Arimathea means excellent discipleship. It's not Mary of Nazareth, who's one of the women who's at the tomb. It's two other women who are named Mary. It's not Peter who carries Jesus's cross, but his namesake, Simon of Cyrene. So these are all symbolic names that encourage the reader to be more faithful to Jesus than his own family was and his disciples were. Joseph of Arimathea dares to go at night and to ask for the body of Jesus, and he comes back and buries him. These parallels were recognized by Byzantine authors, at least two of them, more likely a whole school of them, and they were exploited so that to tell, retell the story of Jesus' death, they used lines from Homer, and especially the, um, the negotiation for the corpse by Joseph of Arimathea. Now, one may say, well, I'm not saying Jesus wasn't crucified. Of course he was crucified. I'm not saying that he was, wasn't buried somehow. I, my, my suspicion is that he was. But the point of these stories is Hector's body stayed in a grave. And Jesus, according to this tradition, and well, already with Paul, was raised from the dead. So by uh, making these identifications and these similarities, the differences between the two heroes should stand out. And this is a part of this great mimetic strategy. It was recognized in antiquity. There are um, lots of uh, uh, echoes um, between the two. It was a story extremely well known in antiquity. We have more art on this episode in ancient Greece than we have of any other episode, Homeric episode. The only rival would be um, the Dionysian tradition, which is a different story. But I think that's one of the examples where uh, I find it impossible to make a claim there's no connection between these stories. It just solves too much 
and one can see why an author would be interested in making the comparison by, oh, and by the way, also, the death of Hector leads to the fall of a city, it leads to the fall of Troy. For Mark, the death of Jesus anticipates the destruction of Jerusalem. That's why the veil of the temple is rent in two. So the, the when one starts to pile up these parallels, they're not. Um, it's not simply looking at the sky and seeing patterns that people want to see. It's actually the clouds themselves are shouting out that this is what the this is the picture that the, the authors are portraying. How can a a lay person see this for themselves? Um, do they like? Is it an easy read to read about Hector and and see these these parallels for themselves, or or is it pretty much impossible for the layperson to to put to basically see what you just said? <laughs> Segway. Cam is holding up my book, Mythologizing Jesus, and I wrote that for my grandchildren so that they would understand the uh, the subtitle is from Jewish teacher to epic hero. Um, and that really encapsulates it for me. It's an attempt. No, it is not easy um, for several reasons. One, um, Homer is written in archaic Greek. The epics are long. It no longer is a part of our Western tradition as it used to be, as required reading in, in high school or college, in literature classes. And the parallels are, um, they're not easy to see. So my other books, including um, the Gospels and Homer and Luke and Virgil, attempt to um, make this easy for the reader. So I give my own translation of the texts. It's not exhaustive. It's an attempt to make um, this literature accessible and then to identify some of the parallels in the New Testament. No, it's not easy. Yeah, I for those of you who are who are watching these texts are wonderful and they're wonderful to read for their own sakes and I can guarantee that you'll find it to be rewarding if you give yourself maybe 4 days with the Iliad and 3 days with the Odyssey um it it really end to end of 4 days maybe with the Aeneid just read them for your own enrichment and for being a human being and the pathos of war and loss and death and ambiguity. Um, they are just glorious for them in their own right. You know, uh, 10 or 15 years ago when I was coming out of Christianity, I, um, I heard about you and I heard about the parallels between, uh, you know, Jesus casting the devil um, into pigs and compl and comparing that to the Cyclops. And I made notes and I still have them and I want to bring them up. And, and what I actually did was I downloaded the Odyssey, uh, the whole thing. And mm -hmm. I, I used control F on my keyboard and I searched for keywords and I tried to put the pieces together myself and it was a lot of work, but let me know how you think I did. Um, uh, here, here's my notes from 15 years ago. I don't even know if you can read that, uh, but what I'll do is I'll read it out loud. And so okay. this is a comparison of the Odyssey Cyclops story written 700 years before the New Testament and Jesus and the demon-possessed man. So um, Odysseus sails with several ships with a crew of men to a distant land, the land of the Cyclops. And Jesus sails with several ships with a crew of men to a distant land, the land of the Gadarenes. Um, yeah. Uh, number two, Odysseus disembarks and tells all but 12 of his crew to stay in the ships. Jesus disembarks and goes alone while all 12 of his crew remain in the ship. So far, is that right? <laughs> well, I don't know that the, the crew stayed in the ship in the Gospels, but yeah, you're doing great so far. Number three, Odysseus immediately meets the Cyclops, Polyphemus, in a cave. Jesus immediately meets a man possessed by demons coming out of a tomb or a cave-like structure. Number four, right. number four, the Cyclops asks Odysseus his name. Jesus asks the demon-possessed man his name. 
Number five, Odysseus says his name is nobody or no man. And um, the man tells Jesus his name is legion, which means thousands of men. Number six, Odysseus blinds the Cyclops, thus defeating him. Jesus sends the demons from the man, thus defeating them. Odysseus and his remaining men escape by riding on the underside of sheep. The demons escape the man by riding inside of pigs, both domestic animals. <laughs> uh, number eight, Odysseus and his men return to the ship. Jesus returns to the ship. Odysseus calls back to the shore and taunts the Cyclops, declaring himself king. Jesus calls back to the shore, but does not reveal he is king. What do you think? Oh, that's brilliant. And I wanted just to make two other comments about it. One is you almost never made comments that require Greek. And you're not talking about... Um, verbal similarities. You're talking about sequences of motifs. And people who um, insist on a kind of philological fundamentalism that in order to have literary connection, you have to have quotation or exact wording are off the mark. Most imitations you have in antiquity are just the kind of thing that you've identified. They have to do with motifs, they have to do with sequences, they have to do with meaningful transforms. So what you've got there is right on target. Um, my question to you is, was there any sequence of the parallels or any one in particular that you thought was distinctive enough that you said, oh yeah, that's probably what's going on? The domestic animals really, uh took me back like pigs and sheep the uh no uh -huh. the nobody and legion like the playing off of um you know sort of opposites um, i agree with that one and um what else well you also have the circe story where circe turns soldiers into swine and uh, jesus can do that too let me uh show you another example um and by the way, this really shook me up when I was a Christian. Like, it really impacted me. It, it really made me doubt. Um, because Doug was a fundamentalist. Yeah, I came from a, fun, fun, I came from a Mennonite background, which is very conservative. But let me make I this... used to teach at Goshen College, by the way. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm going to make this as big as I can. Um, tell me what you think of this one, the woman washing the hero's feet analogy, the Odyssey versus Mark. In the Odyssey, a woman, Eurycleia, meets a stranger, Odysseus. In Mark, a woman meets a stranger, Jesus. Number two, um, Odysseus is recognized by the woman as someone worthy. Jesus is recognized by the woman as someone worthy. Liquid is spelled in the Odyssey, a water bowl is tipped over. Liquid is spilled in uh, Mark, the jar is broken. Uh, Eurycleia anoints Odysseus, the woman anoints Jesus. And then immediately the discussion shifts to uh, Odysseus' enemies, the suitors and the unfaithful servants. And in Mark, the discussion shifts immediately to Jesus' betrayal or Judas, which is weird because why would that come up? It's just like... Exactly. Yeah. Well, let me, let, let me add one more piece to it that I think for me is, uh, is quite remarkable. The name Eurycleia means renowned far and wide. And what it said in Mark is what this woman has done will be remembered wherever the gospel is preached. So she has Eurycleia. She has uh, renown far and wide. But the other is that um, if one adds the gospel of Luke to this, the woman in um, the Odyssey, the Eurycleia, recognizes Jesus, uh, recognizes Odysseus, by the wound on his leg. When Luke has his story, he says that Jesus reveals who he is by exposing his hands and his feet. Oh. So it says, in, he uses exactly the same words in Greek. It is I, ego me. I never thought of that um, before, but you're right. I, I remember reading the Odyssey and yeah, the, the, the scar on his foot or leg, yeah. yeah. So do you think, Dennis, that this demonstrates Luke recognized Mark's mimesis? He had to have recognized some of it. 
um, because in a few cases, he actually accentuates um, the, the Homeric parallels. Whether he understood all of them, actually, I, I doubt that he did see all of them. Um, but he certainly had the same project and must have recognized at least some of them and, of course, was not objecting to it, extended that whole enterprise. I was, uh, Cam and I both actually were talking to a pastor just the other day. I'll leave him nameless. He's probably watching. And um, he was making the comment that he didn't think the New Testament authors borrowed from Greek texts or, you know, they, they borrowed from the Old Testament, but that makes sense because God authored the whole Bible. So that makes sense. And then I brought up this to him and I could see it in his eyes that, really impacted him and it was the sons of thunder uh in mark it's <laughs> a wonderful example yeah. yeah so he's saying well no the the gospel writers they didn't borrow from from uh greek myth and then i just immediately popped up mark 317 james the son of zebedee and john the brother james whose surname boenargus that is sons of thunder and then mark 10 and he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And James and John say, um, grant us to sit one at your right hand and one at your left in your glory. Can you talk a little bit about this, like why this is important, why this is an example of, uh, of imitation? The Dioscari, Castor and Pollux, or Polydeuces in Greek, were had a single name. They are the Dioscari, that is, they are the young boys or sons of Zeus. They were famous sailors. Um, they had one divine parent, that is, Polydeuces was the son of, uh, of Zeus and therefore immortal. The Castor was the, um, a, a, the son of a mortal. So when Castor dies, Polydeuces is really upset. And he's out of love for his brother, he said, he made a deal with Zeus, allow us to live on alternate days so that I'll die uh, on alternate days and then Castor will come back to life. And, um, and then on the following day, I'll come back to life and Castor will die. So they shared a single immortality. When they're depicted in ancient art, they both are divinized, and you can see, and on either side often of a seated deity. So when they ask to sit on Jesus's right and left hand, they apparently don't care which one is on which side. And it's when he, Jesus is seated in his glory, they want to be seated as well. Well, here you have two sailors that want to have special con, um, considerations in the afterworld, in the afterlife. They don't care on which side they are. And Greek art, including coins, frequently depict them as glorified on either side of a seated deity. So by calling them sons of thunder, you're identifying the Dioscari, who are sons of Zeus, who is, of course, the Greek god of thunder and they're sailors and uh, they speak in unison occasionally it uh, these are really quite striking similarities in my view i think it's incredible and there seems to as well to be another um kind of reversal of expectations or the least being first where they ask to sit at the right and left hand of jesus but in the end there are actually two criminals um or, or so i i can yes, yes 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 there's that part too yes 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 and the q document that is retained in both matthew and luke says um when the son of man sits in the crown on the throne of his glory you too will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of israel mark seems to know that tradition and but he wants to reserve the thrones for those who are martyred so he says to James and John, are you able to drink my cup and to be baptized with my baptism? And they say, yes, we are. He says that will happen, but 
to give those thrones is not mine to give. It is reserved for those who uh, follow me, um, that, that is, who are the martyrs. So um, that, that's a wonderful example of what I would call eclectic mimesis, where uh, Mark is using the Q document or Christian tradition on the one hand and a classical model on the other and molding them. And by the way, this is how mimesis was taught in schools. They were to mix um, their models so that people wouldn't accuse them of plagiarism. And they were often um, to take uh, models from, um, as in Herodotus, from, let's say, the uh, Scythians, and to merge it with something that comes from Greek tragedy and to mold it into something that's new. The model that is often used for this in Greek and Latin literature, it's like a bee that goes from flower to flower, connecting pollen and then making narrative honey. And the what I'm arguing for is not exclusive commitment of the gospel authors to Homer or to uh, Greek tragedy. They are involved in this eclecticism where they have Jewish texts, they have Christian indigenous Christian tradition, they have Greek models, but we've been, I think, tone deaf to the Greek models. And that's, that's what I'm trying to bring into the orchestra, that we get these additional, uh, these additional instruments. Yeah, I think um, a lot of people can't seem to imagine the gospel author, authors as creative um, forces. They, and, and I think part of it comes from a desire to see these um, texts as being, you know, faithful to real events that occurred, um, you know, both in terms of wanting to place them very early on, um, following Jesus's death, but also um, to, uh, yeah, just to effectively to beef up the historicity of the text. And what would you say to those people who just can't see um, the authors as being these creative forces? Well, again, I would ask them to explain these similarities. I just don't think they can be easily dismissed. But the other is, that I think uh, I would give an analogy of religion and music that we need to understand the creation of these texts aesthetically as a, as works of art and to appreciate them as such and to realize that they are human products, but they're human products that have ethics or commitments or uh, um, values that we continue to identify with. Put another way, if one says that the gospel authors are interested in being historians, it excuses them of any moral responsibility for the narratives they're creating. If we say they're artists, we, I think, exalt them in saying that they have these values that we can continue to cherish. It could be nonviolence, it could be care for the poor, it could be um, compassion, it could be uh, affirmation of life. There are all kinds of ways to understand it. I think to read the gospels as history is tragically to misrepresent them. And to read them mimetically is to understand their, the, their authors huge artistic contribution. And um, I, I really think it's tragic. Mm, I, I think it is too. So following um, in a similar thing, an argument's often put forth to uh, identify the Gospels of, as being of the genre of ancient biography or uh, bioi or wh whatever it's called. And I think a lot of people um, make the assumption that to identify them with a particular genre means that their contents could only contain that which was like historically accurate or, um, you know, real biographical information of events in Je Jesus's life and his character. Um, do you think that 
placing the gospels in a particular genre can um, determine whether or not um, the events nar narrated within are historical. Cam, I'm so glad you raised the question of genre. I don't use the word genre very often in my writing. And in this way, I'm informed by uh, some classicists who argue that ancient rhetoric was not taught by genre. That is, you didn't, um, you didn't have a list of things that characterize a bios, that is a biography, or a list of character characteristics of history, or a list of characteristics of rhetoric. What happens is people say, okay, you want to write a history? Saturate yourself with Herodotus. You want to write a letter? Saturate yourself with Cicero. If you want to write um, a, um, a, a tragedy, take a look at uh, Euripides and so on. So that they, w genres are distinctions that we make and we try to describe genre the same way that Aristotle tried to describe epic. But the way people learn to write is not that they had a catalog of things that are required for a bios or for a history. Rather, they saturated themselves in actual um, models. So for example, in my view, the Q document already has elements of a gospel. Mark comes along and he adds Homeric imitation. And then Matthew comes along and he uh, is informed by Mark and Q, in my view. Luke comes along and he knows the synoptics, including Matthew, in my view. And so he writes a gospel. Luke knows at least Mark and, I mean, John knows, the author of the Gospel of John, knows at least Mark and Luke. And then apocryphal gospels know those gospels. And so we have a gospel genre because we have a chain of mimesis, a chain of imitation where one person reproduces another. The same thing's true of the Acts of the Apostles. Does the Acts of the Apostles carry some of the characteristics of ancient historians? And the question then is, what are those characteristics? They weren't taught in school that way. If you wanted to learn to write a history, you wrote, um, you read Herodotus. But his model probably was more poetic, including the, the Aeneid. And so um, the literary characteristics we find in the Acts of the Apostles have far less to do with ancient historical writing than they do with particular models he was using for the crafting of his narrative. So I think we need to have a, I think we need to bury genre in the backyard and plant a tree on top of it. And I would say the tree needs to be called mimesis criticism because the ancients did not learn to write by categories of genre. Those are our categories. And that's why, by the way, there's such a discussion of in what way do the gospels look like, a, like BOA? In what ways do the Acts of the Apostles look like, or does it differ from histories? Well, they differ from them because there's no fixed determination of what a bios or a historia is. So um, we have to look at what models inform them and not what genres inform them. Um, I want to get to some questions that have been happening in the chat. Uh, but first, I have a question. When we were talking about Castor and Polydeuces, uh, do you believe James and John were actually historical people if they can be compared so easily to uh, these Greek twins? Um, sure. The both names appear in a list of apostles, a, a list of disciples, in my opinion, um, in the Q document. And Paul knows of uh, followers of Jesus, um, uh, James and Peter, and there's no reason to suspect that they never existed. It's, again, it's a matter of uh, mytho mythological reshaping of the characters to give them more of a narrative function than it is to create them whole cloth. Okay. And uh, someone in the chat asked about, uh, what would a guy like Bart Ehrman say to your books? 
have you talked to Bart Ehrman ever before? Has he read your books? Do you know? And has he, what, what do you think his thoughts are? Well, he should have read one of them because I gave him a copy. But I don't know. it. Uh, as far as I can tell, this is he's tone deaf to mimesis criticism. And I've told him that. I said in the next edition of his introduction to the New Testament, he needs to consider, at least in the margins, the uh, the role of classical Greek literature and so on. And I'm I'm really very disappointed that he's tone deaf on it. I can give you an example. He and I were on a, uh, and we are friends, and I admire his work. And uh, I don't know what he thinks of mine, but he doesn't. It doesn't make much use of it. We were on a, a panel together, you know, on the. Um, on Judas Iscariot, and he gave a kind of traditional form critical uh, assessment of uh, Judas Iscariot, which I considered to be altogether wrong, and argued that Judas Iscariot plays the role of Melantho in the Odyssey, and that was Mark's model for it. And Bart had never considered it. Let me, this is an opportunity maybe to say something that I find to be frustrating. It's there are relatively few people in my field who know my work and have chosen to challenge it. It's more common for them to ignore it. And the problem of having work ignored is it's impossible who's ignoring it and how do you, how do you, you can't force people to read your work and to interact with it. And, um, so that's been a major frustration. I think that's one of the reasons that I am relatively productive in coming up with um, more work. And I've got two books under contract now because I think um, you can't ignore everything. And at some point you have to say, yes, something like this is going off, going on. Maybe McDonald has over um, interpreted it and seen it in places where it is not. But um, the, the best way to kill a hypothesis is not by arguing against it. It's by ignoring it. And I, then, and yeah. Trouble, troubling to argue against it brings it to light and, you know, that, that's not what they want. And I, I agree with you. And I think that um, there are some pretty serious deficiencies within the field of um, New Testament criticism. And this is, this would be one of them is engaging in paradigms to the exclusion of others without principled reasons for doing so. Um, and I think much of it comes by way of how students are trained within academic institutions um, and, you know, the types of things students are introduced to within those academic in institutions and there there it creates this kind of inertia um but i certainly hope that a future generation of scholars those coming through now will engage with your work in ways that um maybe an older generation hasn't well thank you so much and i think the way you articulated the problem is right on the money the issue starts with education and I feel your your pain. Like uh, I I can empathize with you that uh, I a lot of people ignore my work on YouTube, and uh, I can't force them to watch my videos. But you know, I try. <laughs> yeah. uh, another question is, um, I think I know the answers to these, but do you believe that the Jesus depicted in the Gospels actually existed, and do you believe he actually rose from the dead? Um. Yes, there was a historical Jesus who was mythologized in the Gospels, it, to some extent beyond recognition, I would think. And uh, among the things that are above um, recognition would be a physical rising from the dead. That doesn't mean that early Christian views on Jesus' resurrection are meaningless. They are actually quite meaningful, and we need to understand the importance of mythology for the affirmation of life, for saying that um, whereas the Greek deities were involved in killing people and even Zeus couldn't raise his own son, um, Jesus' father raises him from the dead, who of us wouldn't rather have 
um, a God who's invested in life rather than death and so on. So I think there are ways of talking about resurrection that don't fall into historicizing traps, but nonetheless reward mythological thinking. I'm attracted to the notion of a second naivete. That is um, the how mythology and fiction can work on someone on the other side of criticism, to know that it didn't happen, and at the same time to own the beauty of the mythology. And I think that's something, that's something that we have really failed to communicate in usual Christian churches. Um, not in all, but there's an, a need for that second naivete on the other side of criticism to say, we can own these mythologies and be attracted to them, even though we know they're mythologies. And this, for me, is one of the big errors of the, mythis, the mythicist uh, viewpoint. To, to say that Jesus is mythologized is not to say that Jesus is not important or that he didn't exist. exist. It means that you have to have a different hermeneutic or appreciation for the importance of myth and creativity in the creation of meaning. Okay, mm. and we yeah. we do this all the time with other fiction. I mean, you look at the popularity and appreciation for the models um, demonstrated within, uh, like J.K. Rowling's work in Harry Potter, sure. and we engage in this culturally and lift up these models as ones we want to emulate and and you know the embodiment of values that we I, idealize and so i don't see why we can't do that with the the literature of of the ancients too but i want to i want to channel cs lewis right now and if he were here i think he would say Dennis, I don't think we can cherry pick and say, well, we can, you know, we can view this as a myth and and learn the important lessons and morals about it because the Gospels clearly teach that Jesus was God. And if he isn't God and the stuff he taught about vicarious redemption, if he's not God, this is evil. This is worse than Satan himself. So how can you take anything good out of the Gospels if if Jesus isn't God, he's a despicable, crazy lunatic. Well, I'm I'm not sure I agree with your characterization of C.S. Lewis, so I'm not going to take on C.S. Lewis, whom I admire. Um, but I will uh, address the C.S. Lewis of what you just said. If that's the case, I think it is so unfortunately uncreative of someone who's so adept at writing his own fictions, that his fictions are powerful and they've informed um, count the, well, several generations of readers and had them understand that life is meaningful and purposeful and that we live in communities and that we have uh, reason to be hopeful, whether it's Aslan or whatever one wants to identify. So I think the I think there's a an absence of creativity and moral courage. Um, I think it's embarrassing for us to have to, for some Christian believers, but this is true for some Jews too, with their own traditions, and probably and, and surely Muslims. We don't want to take. We don't want to admit that our fictions aren't written in stone but they're written by humans who are imaginative and creative and, mean, and create meaning by means of mythology. And we, somehow we want to anchor that in history or in divine revelation. And I think, it's, I think we need to live not only with ambiguity, but, uh, but with a great deal of humility and appreciation for mythology that is too often missing in theology. Theology often wants to be foundational. I think I would want to change foundational into recreational, that there's something imaginative and beautiful about fiction. And your characterization of C.S. Lewis, if it's right, I think is unfortunate for someone who's so capable 
of crafting meaning out of fiction. Hmm. Um, a guy emailed me yesterday knowing that you'd come on and he asked about, do you feel free enough to talk about this stuff in your social circles? Uh, like when the topic of religion comes up uh, and you're in a room full of uh, other Christians, do you kind of have to silence yourself or do you feel, feel open to just saying, yeah, I think most of the gospels is myth and copies Homer or old Testament writings. How would you answer that question? Well, I think one needs to be respectful. I'm not trying to make any disciples, but I also don't hold back. But the other thing is, um, I travel in very progressive circles, and I live in a community that is uh, largely identified as Christian, but these are uh, social activists and um, uh, denominational um, administrators and so on. And so they wouldn't necessarily share my views, but no, I, I certainly don't throttle myself. I'm not interested in making disciples, but I am interested in making waves. And I think the only way to do that is to be honest and transparent, but at the same time, generous and understanding diversity and not everybody can, um, can enjoy Homer as much as I do. I'm much more interested in what religion does for them. Does it oppress women? Does it um, d does it care for the poor? Does it work for peace and the protection of the environment? So my attitude toward religion has much less to do with my own work that way than it does with the social values that I see in the New Testament that these writers are espousing. And I think it's one of the great tragedies without declaring too obviously my political orientation that those too often who most venerate the Bible are most distant from its values when it comes to political assessment and social assessment. So I am less interested in assessing religion by whether they buy into mimesis criticism and Homer than I am is what does this religion do for families and for the environment and for culture and for people who are less uh, fortunate than I am. I'm not interested in making disciples, but I am interested in making waves. Do you mind if I add that to my YouTube profile? <laughs> yeah, that's like a quote for all quotes. <laughs> I wrote it down. That's great. Cam, did you have any last questions? We've been going for over an hour already. Um, I mean, o only really to say thank you for taking time out of your your day and your writing time and sharing some of your work with with an, an audience and i really appreciate it and i hope that you that you get other opportunities to do it as well because it's been really cool oh thank you so much you guys yeah and thank you to uh uh all the people who contributed in chat it was very respectful thank you for that and uh, we had um Probably, if I have to guess, close to 200 people who watched, you know, probably some people came in and out. So um, uh, the books you want to promote that people, if they are more, if they're interested in some of the stuff we were talking about, Cam, you want to hold them up? Or if you have them there, guys? So I think that this is the most accessible book um, that Dennis has, has written and it's a it's a quick read I read it in under a day and it was wonderful um, a more comprehensive um, look at the Gospels and um, Homer in particular um, Mark and, and Luke is the Gospels and Homer and then uh, furthering on that volume two of the same series is Luke and Virgil um, which more deeply uh, or deeply explores the connections between the Aeneid and uh, Luke and Acts. And also, if I might, um, the most recent book was um, the Dionysian Gospel, uh, the fourth gospel and Euripides, or the Gospel of John and Euripides. Thank you, everybody. If people want to contact you, is... Is there a, a good way for them to contact you if they have questions, uh, or do you prefer just to stay uh, anonymous? Do you have a website? 
Well, I want to make waves. So yes, I, um, it's best just to contact me um, with email and that's D M A C D O N at C S T dot E D U. Perfect. And people can uh, uh, replay it and we'll, and get that uh, email address. Correct. Our friend Chet just said, say the names for the podcast. So, um, it's uh, Luke and Virgil is one book, Mythologizing Jesus and the Gospels and Homer. And what's the John book? The Dionysian Gospel. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I have a podcast. <laughs> I'm terrible at advertising <laughs> these things. Okay. Thanks again. Thank you, everybody in chat, for uh, hanging out. And we'll see you next time. Take care.